very, very quick whistle stop tour through our thoughts on, on VR. Um, and this specifically is around consumer VR. So there's plenty of interesting industry applications, but at the moment we're just looking at the consumer side. And so we don't get confused, let's start off with VR. What is it and what's AR? So this is VR. The uh, gormless expression is pretty mandatory. As soon as you put the headsets on, this is the kind of expression you adopt. So, you know, fully, fully enclosed. Can't actually see all of the headphones on there, but basically you can see nothing apart from what's in the viewer, and you can't hear anything. And there's some form of external output, input rather than like a keyboard or mouse or controllers. This is AR. This is Microsoft's HoloLens, or at least sort of an artist's rendering of. Lots of similarities, you've still got a headset, you've still got some kind of input. Technically, there's a lot more uh, a commonality there as well. They're both using cameras, they're both using motion sensors, they're both using fairly high-end hardware to render images. But as this kind of suggests, you're able to see other things around you as well as the, uh, the imaginary green alien. This is AR. So is Pokemon Go. So what we're trying to do is differentiate between Today's AR, which is smartphone based, point and things up here, and this, which we're sort of calling immersive AR. Still largely in the lab. Or, well, you can buy a HoloLens, but it's incredibly expensive and not much runs on it. So, this is AR and VR, completely separate disciplines, uh, and that becomes apparent when you start looking at the applications. So, VR, in the consumer space at least, is entertainment. It's interactive video, interactive experiences, like games. It's VR or 360 video. All of the other things start to kick in more on the business side. I'll come back to theme parks, that's an interesting one. But those are the fully immersive, I don't know what I'm doing apart from I have this headset on. I'm typically in a small room or I'm sat down and I'm using a headset. AR, on the other hand, as you can see, has a much wider spread of applications and many more which you could think of as crossing over into the business world as well as the consumer world. So, navigation, simulation, uh, data, communications, all of these things could happen in AR. It's why a lot of people are predicting, as, as you could, that ultimately AR will be a bigger field than VR, particularly counting all the business and enterprise use as well as the consumer use um, compared to VR, but it's not here yet. So what we learn from VR, certainly the tools and the hardware, we can apply to AR. Today, just VR. So VR is actually quite a lot older than uh, many people think. Starting way back in the sort of mid 60s when it was first sort of conceived of, um, as with many of these things, in uh, sort of basically military research. Um, and it went through a, a consumer phase. Up there is a virtuality rig. Um, for those of you who are old school uh, computer geeks, there's actually a Commodore 64 in the base of that rig generating an allegedly immersive 3D image. So you can imagine how shonky that was. Not quite as shonky as the Nintendo Virtual Boy, uh, which was legendarily bad. And then the dawn of the new age of VR, the successful age, if you will, that we're in now, really started with Palmer Luckey's Kickstarter of the Oculus back in 2012, we said. Oh, we're now in the phase of this hardware is in the field of the high-end stuff, like Oculus, like the HTC Vive, uh, the Sony PlayStation VR out next week, several others waiting in the wings. And lots of mobile-enabled VR headsets too. Google's likely to announce two new handsets and possibly a headset in about three hours' time at its conference uh, on the West Coast. So that space of the headsets, the headsets are here, effectively. Uh, the content, as you'll see, is lagging behind fairly significantly. So that's just a cute timeline. By the way, you'll notice that my graphics are in between really nice and kind of shonky. Guess which ones were done by a professional graphics person? That one wasn't mine, for instance. If we look at our headset forecast, 
So this is how many VR headsets there will be out in the world for the next five years for consumers, remember. We get to these kind of numbers. Uh, Rob highlighted the 2020 number, third of a billion headsets globally by 2020. But at the moment, we're unfortunately, we're still at the 71 million number. And if you can read these, most of those are promotional headsets. Google Cardboard, in other words. Free ones that you get at events, and much like event pens, you use once, put in a drawer, throw away two years later. But they are getting people experiences of VR. But it means that that install base of true aficionados is still yeah, 20 million people by the end of this year. Not a big market. Not a big market. We differentiate between types of headsets. I'm not going to go into that, but you know, that's the Google Cardboard, the free one. That's the high-end HTC uh, uh, Vive. Region splits are interesting too. We can do that, but uh, it won't surprise you to know that if you look at the mobile VR, in five years' time, the <coughs> largest install base of the largest platform will be in China. Will be in China, with Western Europe and North America following behind. Again, not one of my graphics. Content. That's what's interesting about VR. Oh, one of my graphics. Uh, what's interesting about VR is the content. People don't buy it for stupid headsets and looking really geeky when there are other people around. Um, not many people do anyway. What they want to do is get really, really cool experiences when they're wearing that headset. And if we look at the three areas that this mainly boils down to, it's VR video, which isn't the same as 360 video, Grab me a, a, the drinks later, and I'll give you a long explanation of why. VR games, or interactive entertainment. Everest VR is absolutely stunning in terms of what you can do with a generated <coughs> VR environment uh, on today's hardware. And apps, very small category, which is stuff that basically isn't a game, but isn't a video either. Uh, the example here is big screen where you basically put your headset on and you and three or four other people can share your desktops so you can see what other people are working on. It's almost a collaboration tool, but mainly used for porn. Um, which, as far as I'm aware, collaboration tools don't tend to specialise in. The way that that splits out is that this year, it's tiny, all told, globally. The actual content market is sort of maybe seven uh, billion dollars. No, one, $1.5 billion, uh, and predominantly games. And predominantly, that's going to be the people who bought their HTC Vive, bought their Oculus Rift, or are going to buy the PlayStation VR headsets. Big spending consumers who basically want to justify their purchase by buying games and content for it. Everest, for instance, is a 45-minute experience, and it's 30 bucks. Yes, you can play it more than once, but it doesn't change hugely. That changes over time. And we get to a world, unsurprisingly, where video becomes the biggest content area for VR. To Rob's <coughs> session earlier on, it's a great uniter. Not everybody wants to play a game in VR. Most people would be interested in watching a video in VR. And so you see that both pay TV providers will offer little top-ups of subscriptions to get their VR video. Online streamers will offer add-ons to allow VR video. And you'll start to see people actually producing professional content just for VR video headsets once that install base gets to a decent level, beyond 2 million, effectively. So that overtakes gaming in 2018. Again, we can do this regionally. The Chinese region, despite being the highest sort of install base of headsets, lags somewhat behind in terms of the content spending. There will be a lot of content, but it will be largely generated peer-to-peer, -peer, people who've got their 360 cameras, or it'll be demo content, free content that comes with something else, or brand promotions. If we put those two sides together, the hardware and the software, we get to think of something like this. So a market approaching $28 billion by 2020. Starting off heavily weighted towards the hardware, as we've seen already, and then eventually, the content, what people actually want, 
taking over in terms of the stem. This includes headsets and software. It doesn't include cool things like haptic controllers, or there's actually a treadmill that you can run in VR in, uh, the Omni treadmill, which is very cool, but uh, yeah, isn't included in these things. I haven't sized that market as of yet, the treadmill. Give me another couple of weeks. So those are the numbers. Interesting to just reflect on what the wider impact is. Sure, that's an interesting $28 billion market in five years' time for those of us in the media side or the, the hardware side. But we're also looking at the gaming and video markets as a whole. Video is interesting. Most of that video revenue will be additive. It won't be, oh, I'm going to drop a channel for my pay TV package to get VR. It will be, I'll pay a little bit more or I'll pay for something else to get that video. Gaming's not quite the same. Even those high-end headset owners will have a certain amount of spend for their games. And if they say, I'm going to get a VR game, they will probably not get a traditional game. The reality is, for the next couple of years, the games will be a mix of both. So it'll be a, you know, a standard game with a VR level. You already see these available for sort of the Batman games, for instance. There are obviously massive applications for education and training here. I used to cover things like Second Life back in the day, which was a, a mitigated disaster. But what it did demonstrate was that actually building simulations in these virtual worlds for emergency preparedness training or for you know, the Battle of Runnymede was a very, very visual, very effective way of getting people to engage with that piece of history or that piece of training. That will come back with a force with, with VR as the costs lower. And you're also seeing a lot of university course and research centres starting to develop unique content for uh, phobia aversion uh, techniques using VR, where you don't actually have to put a massive spider on somebody's hand, you can just put a massive virtual spider on somebody's hand. It's much more friendly for the spider. Uh, and, and you saw that example of AR of industrial design, you know, the model of the green alien. You're going to see a lot of that as well as people develop more of those probably business side applications. For the consumer hardware market and for our telco market, it's more of a mixed picture. Uh, we have some winners and losers in a minute, uh, and that will highlight that a bit more, but this isn't going to be a massive market for hardware. It's not going to be the next small smartphone market. And it's going to be stuff which is very, very slim margins. This stuff's expensive to build, and consumers only have a certain tolerance in terms of how much they'll pay, which is a recipe for two manufacturers making money, everybody else losing their shirts. And the bad news on the telco side is, if you look at, say, streaming video to VR headsets, VR headsets are very quickly going to get to 4K resolution. Very quickly get to 4K resolution. And you're streaming two of them at 60 frames a second, uh, uh, with potentially a higher resolution than 4K because you won't have a 4K slice there, 4K slice there, 4K slice there, and you have to stream all of it. Any of our sort of uh, compression experts in the audience will know that's adding up to a huge amount of data very, very quickly, which is why initially a lot of this stuff will still be download only or will even be on physical media because it's just too difficult to get across the network. We can chat about other areas that will be impacted later on. But just to finish off, wins and losers. He looks happy, we'll call him a winner. Winners, VR hardware manufacturers. If you're a HTC, if you're an Oculus, um, if you're a Starbreeze, you're making money, or at least breaking even, from making headsets and controllers. So that's a new market that didn't exist. Whether you make profit is a different matter, but you're certainly making money. Similarly, the content providers, those guys who have trained in a Unity engine, which is a, a gaming engine, can develop VR environments very, very easily and publish them like, like the Everest VR to a store or a platform. The platforms don't exist yet. This is one of the key challenges. Nobody really knows whose hardware or whose app store is going to dominate for all this content because there isn't enough of it and there's not enough people making money from it as of yet. Mobile operators giving cheap headsets away to encourage replacement cycle. Or using you know, uh, uh, NHL hockey 
in VR to drive people into their stores, as Rogers did with Jaunt. Similarly, the content firms, and I mean both the Skies and the Netflix of this world, will use VR either as a promotional channel, certainly initially, but then also to drive people into their packages or to upgrade their packages as they've done with 4K and things like that. Social platforms will be the main platform where a lot of this 360 video is shared, which will be a new element that, that people will engage with and maybe pop on their headsets and, and uh, comment and feedback and share further. That's largely why Facebook's involved in this kind of space. And then venue owners. I'm going to come back to that one because I've got one on, a, a, on the, my very final slide. The downs, downside, that's Kino, not looking happy in joining the menu. So he's a loser. Mentioned the bandwidth constraints here are huge. And it is pure consumer, so it's not as though you're going to get people to pay for QoS. They're just going to say, well, this doesn't work. So the ability to sell a telco customer a VR broadband package is probably going to be as limited as it was to sell them a 4K broadband package. Telcos will inevitably try and create their own platforms. They always do this. Orange is trying already, arguably. To try and get people to only use apps on their platform or their preferred partners, their preferred content. Somebody might be able to contradict me, but I've never seen that work in media. It might have worked for a couple of years and then it always goes to an open platform or a vendor platform. Those VR hardware manufacturers, this is going to be a bit of a bloodbath like smartphones. The margins are already slim. If you're an Architel who decided to make their own headset, their own platform, not partner with Google or, <coughs> or with Oculus, you're going to have a really, really hard time of it as those other manufacturers all coalesce onto Google's platform, onto Oculus's platform, onto PlayStation's platform. And there's going to be a, a, a falling out in the traditional camera market as well. Uh, it's been a hard hit market already by smartphones. And now if you're seeing that if people are going to go for a disparate camera, they're probably going to want a 360 camera or a drone camera rather than necessarily a mirrorless digital SLR camera. Again, that market is in very, very steep decline and VR is going to accelerate that decline, I'm afraid. Finally, to watch out for, venue VR. You've already seen some theme parks that use VR. You've seen IMAX are investing with Starbreeze to bring VR cinemas to the world. And you're also starting to see a lot of VR cafes spring up. Uh, this is kind of that transitional phase of people have heard about it, people don't want to buy it themselves, people want to try it, combined with it being a nice experience to be on a roller coaster in VR, apparently. Uh, even more terrifying, I should say. That's one to watch out for. You'll see many more announcements about that from some key players like Disney in the next two to three months. Light field photography. Give me have two, 20 seconds to explain this, I'm not going to. Basically, this is, this is the ability to capture content from a, a, a volume of space rather than through a lens, although it is through a lens, where you can infinitely refocus, you can infinitely shift the angles. This will make VR video indistinguishable from something that's an experience where you're rendering it on the fly. Still largely in the labs, but if you see articles from Intel or Lytro about this, very interesting. And finally, Magic Leap, who are AR, strictly speaking, have hoovered up a massive amount of funding money, uh, largely from people like Google, um, to, to create something that's allegedly a bit like that Microsoft HoloLens <coughs> headset. Great demos, probably one to two years from being in the market, but has the potential to really drive that AR market uh, uh, forward at a rapid pace. But we don't know anything, apart from the logo, and some very nice videos, we don't know anything about them as of yet. So watch those three things. Keep an eye out on that developing platform and ecosystem for VR. Uh, and if at all possible, get the HTC guys to give you a Vive demo, because that is really the state of the art in terms of available hardware at the moment. Thank you very much.